Hello, we are excited to welcome the number one New York Times bestselling author, Jenny Han, to discuss her book series to all the boys I've ever loved before. Jenny Han is an executive producer on all three Netflix films, To the All Boys I've Loved Before, To All the Boys P.S. I Still Love You, and To All the Boys Always and Forever, Laura Jean. She is also the author of the New York Times bestselling Summer I Turn Pretty series. Her books have been published in more than 30 languages. I know that we have many avid fans of Jenny's work present in the audience today. So we are gifting books to attendees who ask questions while supplies last. So please feel free to write in your questions um, in the box right next to the video, and we will announce the winners early next week. Please join me in welcoming the one and only Jenny Han. Hi. Hello, Jenny. Welcome. How are you doing? I am great. How are you, Michelle? I'm good, Jenny. And what have you been up to during this stay-at-home period? Um, I've been working very hard and also doing, like everyone else, like a million Zooms every day. Yes. Um, what else have I been doing? I've been, I was doing for like the first few months, I was taking Korean lessons with a tutor in Korea, which I can speak Korean, but like I wanted to improve um, sort of like more formal um, forms of speech. I don't know about you, but like I grew up just speaking to my parents and my grandparents for yeah. the most part. And so, um, you know, I would like, it's just more difficult when you go in more of a business setting um, and you're like speaking like a third grade level. <laughs> I totally Korean that's that. like very informal. Um, mm -hmm. So I was doing that and I was also sort of doing a lot of Asian cooking Ooh. and um, yeah, and then I took up golf. Oh, you, golf, you can, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Socially distanced. <laughs> yeah, because you can, I would just go to um, the piers in New York and um, just, you don't have to be near anybody. And I was just giving lessons. Mm -hmm. um, I think I was just trying to use the, my time very wisely. Um, I don't know if I'm any better to show for it, but I was busy. It, it sounds like you had things to keep yourself occupied. I can totally understand the language aspect. Uh, I did a research project a couple of years ago in, in Vietnam where my family's from, and I had to bring my mom as a translator because you know, my language is so much more casual than the business acumen that they use in the day to day. Um, so exciting that you you picked up so many new hobbies. Um, maybe people be inspired to also do some cooking or golfing like you. <laughs> I, I think, you know, a hot question before, mm. you know, we, we start going into some, some deeper questions about your, you and your work is that fresh off the press is that your final film uh, to all the boys always and forever is coming out on February 12th. This is the end of the trilogy and the last of the babies that you know you created that are growing up in film form. How does it feel? Do you have any teasers for fans? You know what? Yesterday, it always takes me by surprise how emotional it feels. And it's bittersweet because um, I've been really excited for everyone to see the film. And you know, we, we filmed them back to back. So it already feels like a very long time ago that we mm -hmm. made them. Um, and then when all the fan reactions come out and people were saying, I started reading your books, um, you know, when I was in middle school and now I'm graduating from high school and this means so much to me, or people were saying like, it was the first time that they had seen a Asian American girl like them mm -hmm. um, in a book or in a movie. And for me, that's emotional. Um, so I was definitely tearing up a little bit and feeling really lucky and blessed um, to have such a nice group of people who who love the books and love the movies. And it feels good to be able to give them this gift, which I think the movie is. We worked really hard on it. I just hope they like it. That's all, all, that's all I could think. I always, you know, throughout the whole process, I would just say, I feel like I am sort of the emissary of mm -hmm. um, all the original fans. So I know what they love about it and I, really want to deliver to them um, something that will make them feel happy. And I guess the other piece of it that I wasn't expecting was how many people said that this brought them a bit of joy or comfort over the past few years, which have been really stressful. And the past few weeks have been very stressful. And so people were like, finally, 2021 has some good stuff <laughs> <laughs> happening. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, when I think about your your work and and why fans feel so connected, 
um, you know, there's a pull, right? I think a big part of that is you're, you're right. There, there's an element of comfort and just a degree of kind of an, a different time in your life or maybe a more innocent time in your life that you can look back to, especially for those who are not in their teenage years. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the fact that it's coming out on February 12th and it's on Netflix, right? That's where it'll be coming mm -hmm. out. Netflix will be great home entertainment because I don't see us coming out of the pandemic anytime soon. So all those can view from home on February 12th. Um, so Jenny, I'll say I though, yes. oh, I was going to say that the second movie came out at the same time last year. And it was honestly the last time that I got dressed up or went anywhere <laughs> because the <laughs> premiere happened um, the, the same weekend in February. And then, um, then was the Oscars after that, like the next, I think, week. And I think, I could be wrong, but I think that Parasite winning Best Picture may have been our last good thing <laughs> in the whole year. Um, yes. So, yes. Sorry. Actually, continue, please. you have a fun Parasite story to share too, don't you? I think I've oh, found yes. you somewhere. I do, I do. Um, so we filmed, this is not a spoiler because it's now in the trailer. Um, we filmed um, some of the movie in Korea. And we had, on the first day, um, we were driving around. In Korea, there's like really bad traffic. And so we were driving around and for hours. Um, and our PA was um, the one driving me and the other producer around. And, you know, you're just in the car, just chatting and chatting. And I was talking about Parasite. And I was like, yeah, it's going to win. Like, it's definitely going to be like a best picture, blah, blah, blah. Bong Juno is like a genius. He's a director. Um, and our PA um, was like, oh, is he like famous in America? And I go, yeah, yeah, like he's probably the most famous Korean director, um, or at least like one of one of two. And he was like, oh, cool. And then literally at the, and then I was going, I was just literally talking about it for like an hour. I mean, we were in traffic, so. <laughs> um, then I guess like towards the end of the day, um, the other producer was like, so what do your parents do? And then he was like, oh, my mom is um, a homemaker and my dad is director. And then I was like, oh, like, has he done anything that I would know? And I don't even know why I asked that question because I genuinely hate it when people ask me that question. Uh, people say it all the time. And um, it's like, I don't know what you know. So why, are you, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And then usually yeah. when people ask me, I go, um, which like YA or children's books do you know? And they'll go like mm -hmm. Harry Potter. And I'm go, that's not me. So that's like, yeah. that's really, you know? <laughs> and you don't know me. Um, so then he goes, oh, um, a movie called Mother. And then I was like, oh my God. So his dad is Pong Juno. And I was like, are you kidding me? And I literally screamed and I was like, you little like betrayer. <laughs> <laughs> he let you talk for an hour about what? how much I you admired. So I was like, you have humiliated me. Um, and, but he was super sweet and young and, um, I actually brought him as my like guest for the premiere for the second film because um, he was one of my favorite people from the movie and um, yeah so that's my that's my parasite and then because he was in town for the Oscars mm -hmm. and what was really sweet about it was he was like we were texting back and forth and I'm like you know you should come and like you were a big part of the movies and blah 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 and then he was like yes I'm so excited and then he's literally going to every single like fun Oscar celebrity <laughs> party. But then he came to ours and he was like really happy to be there. And I think it was because it was like his thing. And you know, Parasite's like not his thing. It's like his dad's thing. Mm -hmm. But this was mm -hmm. his thing. And um anyway, yeah, that's my that's my story. What a what a fun story. You know, I want to get to the films and how you adapted the books to films later on this talk. So let's start from the very beginning, right? I've heard that you, like the protagonist, Lara Jean, of To All the Boys, um, you also wrote letters to your crushes as a form of closure. So is this what kicked off your brilliant writing career? No, because I've written, I'd written several other books before um, To All the Boys. But in terms of like being a writer, I guess I've always written stories and um, since I was really little. And I also kept a journal since I was seven. And so I was always writing and I felt like writing the letters helped me process what I was feeling. And mm -hmm. um, like in, in the first letter that I wrote, I had this line that I was like, you know, I'm just gonna write because that's like the best thing that I know how to do and I'm good at it. And that was like <laughs> the tenor of the letter. And um, yeah, so I would say that I, ha I, I think I had the idea when I was 
just in a cab um, in New York. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, what if, what if um, someone wrote love letters, but then they got sent out? And then, and then what happens next? And I think that's kind of the key with telling stories because you you have to be like, and then what, and then what? And mm-hmm. you have to imagine um, your reader sort of following you along on every page, um, wanting to know what happens next. Mm-hmm. I love hearing about that. And you in particular, I think you, you write in young adult and children's literature, right? Um, in particular, mm-hmm. I think you started with um, a children's book when you first started your career. So these are very formative years of the mind, a time when we come of age. What mm-hmm. launched your interest in the genre and how do you go about capturing the essence of what it feels like you know, during this time of first as a teenager? Because for me, I feel like that's many moons ago. So you know, what does it you know, feel like to do all that research? Well, honestly, my first book, um, Shug, I started writing that when I was 20. I think I was 20. So I was just out of my teens and that felt still really resonant, really like sort of close to the surface for me, um, just as a as an artist. And um, that's why I started there. But also I can say I've always loved stories about adolescence and coming of age, just because it's so fertile of a time. And um, naturally, it's naturally interesting. It naturally has a lot of emotions and like um, first times. And so for storytellers, the first time is usually the most interesting time. The first time and the last time. I mean, I think as an adult, you really remember your first love. The middle can get a little bit blurry. You're like, cool. <laughs> You're like, what was I thinking when I was 28? Or what did, what did it look like when I was 33? Mm-hmm. And then you never know when it's going to be the last time either. And mm-hmm. so um, I just think that naturally for me, I kind of am drawn to stories about young people and really approaching it like um, that it's not any different than writing about adults, really. It's just, it's people, it's like human beings. And so you have to come at it with a level of like respect. Um, in, in that experience because it's so all relative um, to what, you know, you've been through or are going through at the time. So in high school, I remember getting into a fight with my best friend or, um, you know, getting a bad grade at school. It really felt like the end of the world. It was like, because your world is only so big, you know? And then as an adult, you break up with a boyfriend or you get fired from work. And then that also feels really big because your um, space around you has like continued to grow, but that doesn't mean that the emotions you felt when you were 15 are irrelevant or unimportant, you know? And so that's how I approach um, writing for young people. I think it, that's a very beautiful way of capturing it. Um, mm-hmm. There should be, you know, due respect given to anything that we, you know, aim to do in life. I, I also love to know too, you, at 20, you said, started your first book. So did you know, you know, in your teenage years that eventually you wanted to be an author? You know, did you ever discuss this with your parents? Uh, I know you no, have a sister. No, no. I didn't because, um, you know, I was always reading. I was always scribbling in my notebooks. But I don't think it was ever a possibility for me in my mind um, because I never met a writer before. It felt very far off and unrealistic. And, you know, I grew up... Um, as the child of two immigrants who had really like blue collar jobs. And so, you know, it it didn't ever feel like a possibility to me in a real sense. Um, I never even honestly considered it. But I think for a lot of people, the arts feel kind of hard to get into and you you don't even know where to start. Because when I decided to go to grad school to get my master's um, in creative writing, I did it knowing that um, the likelihood of me getting a book deal or being able to pay, pay my loans um, was slim. And you know, when you get your teaching degree or you go to law school, you're probably gonna get a job doing something. Um, but that's just not the case with with writing. And you don't know if people are gonna wanna buy your book. You don't even know, you know, I know plenty of people from my program who were really beautiful writers and they never sold anything. Um, and so there's so much that goes into it that has nothing to do with you and, and your skill level. I think that's one of the most Pognant catchers, I think, of what it means like to be an artist. Um, I feel like I've been following a lot of careers of friends and mutual friends throughout time. And 
you're right. Sometimes it is, you know, luck of the draw, or it happens to be that what you're writing is capturing the essence of a time that you're living in. So I'd love to know too, you, you spoke about the MFA, right? Mm -hmm. Would you recommend for aspiring writers today who are in the audience, should you pursue an MFA? Honestly, you know, it's, it's a hard question to answer. I lean towards no, because I think that there's so many more resources now for people um, who want to write, just in terms of you could you could be a really prolific and witty um, blogger, or you could be really great on Twitter and kind of cultivate an audience, or you could be doing any number of things. And I think that uh, when I was starting out, you know, there are just such fewer entryways in. Uh, I think what an MFA is really great for is finding your people and finding people who will be great readers and um, critiquers of your work. And it also teaches you how to receive feedback and, and criticism in a way that um, hopefully will just make your work better. Um, not everybody has that skill. I know people now who are novelists who only show their editor and no one else ever sees it. And I know just for me, I have so many dear friends who are writers who I would never publish something without showing them first um, because I know that they make me better. Uh, and I met a lot of those great people in grad school. Um, but I think that you can meet them other places too, like uh, writing groups online. Um, I think you just kind of find your your fellows, I guess, anywhere. And an MFA is expensive. It's, especially in New York, uh, I think I took out, I took out loans to do it and um, I was living in the dorms and I was an RA and I got like a few little scholarships. Um, but it, you know, I don't regret it at all for me and it's how I got an agent and everything else. But I think it's not necessarily um, a slam dunk of a decision to make. And I think if you're, I think it's really more about being serious about what you're doing. Thanks for that perspective. Um, you, were, you were sharing earlier that, you know, it seems like writing is a labor of love, right? It, you can't do it if it's not something you enjoy. And with no one to look up to you as a writer in, in your early life, it seems like those in your MFA also maybe brought you this whole network of like-minded people who wanted to achieve the same things. So after your MFA, you know, you wrote a bunch of books. Um, they've had a lot of success commercially. It must feel phenomenal to see your books be such hit films on Netflix. What is the adaptation process? from page to screen. And I'm also curious to know, in the writing community, is it common for writers or editors to now consider tweaking certain elements of a book to be more adaptable for a potential film or series hmm. option? I don't think so. And I, you know, even me now, I wouldn't do that. Cause I really feel like with a book, it should be the sky's the limit. You should do, you should set out to tell whatever you want to tell. And don't be thinking about budget of, having elves and doing CGI. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's that's like not something to worry about in that moment. I think in the moment you are really dedicated to seeing your vision come to life and your budget is endless. That's the difference between film and books. Um, you can do anything and that's how I approach it. Um, and I honestly believe that not every book is meant to be adapted. Some things are better left on the page because you know, I always say to fans who come up to me, they're like, oh, I'm disappointed that this thing wasn't in the movie or is it going to be just like the book? And I go, no, because it's not, this This movie is not even my vision. It's literally the director, the screenwriter, everyone is putting their own kind of lens on this thing. And so I, I would say the best movie that you'll ever see of this book is the one that's in your own head because you are imagining mm -hmm. what the characters look like. You created a house, a set, um, costumes. You already did that. And nothing is gonna live up to the story in your head. There's very few adaptations I think um, are exactly what I would have pictured or better. I mean, sometimes you go, wow, this is even better uh, in terms of what they were able to show on camera. And that's, now that I'm screenwriting also, that's probably one of the challenges is in a book, you can you really have unlimited time to uh, spend in the character's head and you can really be literally, especially if you write in first person, you're in the character's head, the character's telling you how they feel. 
And there's both pros and cons to it, but in film, you tell that completely through images. So you have to make sure that everything's making sense. And now that I'm not just a movie goer in the sense of, of just enjoying movies and now I'm watching it to learn and understand, I'm realizing when I pick apart a movie, I go, what is the, what, why did this movie fail? It's because I didn't understand what was happening. And for instance, there's a movie I saw over a pandemic where I cannot tell what the relationship was between the two main characters where I'm like, is that her brother-in-law? Is that her ex-boyfriend? Is that just a friend? And it really um, interfered with my, with my movie going experience the whole time. I was just like, I don't know what's going on. And I think as soon as you start to have those kind of questions and doubts, the veil is sort of like lifted and I'm no longer like enraptured by the story. I'm not lost in the images where I feel like I'm in it. Cause I'm thinking, why did they not tell me who, who they were to each other? And now I don't trust um, the storyteller anymore. And I think for any kind of storytelling, you as the author or the creator, you have the viewer or the reader in the palm of your hand and you're holding them. And, and once they start looking around and the, the, the spell is broken, then it's just kind of like hard to get them back into it. You know how you said that one of the best things is the the movie in your head as you're you know as you're reading a book you definitely see you know the characters you visualize the set in your own mind. I think mm -hmm. all of us can can relate to that. I feel like for me one example of that was when I was growing up and I read the Harry Potter series mm -hmm. and for the first time I saw that there was you know an Asian character Cho Chang on in in the book and I was like well. I imagined her a certain way, and I feel like all my Asian American or Asian Canadian girlfriends imagined her a certain way as well, but come mm -hmm. to the film and we're like, oh, it's a very different rendition, right? Um, which kind of leads me to my next question. Uh, over several decades, you know, we have seen many instances where a character has been written as an Asian American um, individual or as a person of color, but is cast as a white actor by studio executives. When you signed on as executive producer for To All the Boys I've Ever Loved, you know, how did you think about negotiating any differences you might have and how you wrote the book and what, you know, the casting choices may have resulted as? I guess I'll first say that um, as an author and even as an executive producer, you do not, you do not have um, final say on casting at all. You can give your opinions and that like, but you don't get to say, you know, you have to cast it this way. People will tell you, you know, oh yeah, definitely it's gonna be like this way. But then when it comes down to it, they change their minds, then you have no recourse because you've already uh, sold the rights. Um, so it's a tricky position to be in. Even, I know JK Rowling has talked about um, with her films, you don't get like final approval because, and I can understand this because this is millions and millions of dollars um, that the studios are investing in, in making it. And if you gave one person the power to do that and they go, I definitely want it to be Julie Roberts and it can only be Julie Roberts, um, then potentially you have a problem on your hands in terms of, of the film. If the, if the actor isn't right for the part or if they're so expensive that then you can't afford any other actors uh, to be in your movie. Um, so they don't give you that power. And so I didn't have that power either. I'll just say that I met with a lot of producers before um, the ones that I ended up with who straight up were like, no, we, we don't, they didn't even occur to them that um, it would be an Asian lead, honestly. So I, I would say, who are you envisioning? And then they would name actors and none of them were Asian. So I, I would ask, you know, is, are you planning on casting an Asian? And they're like, oh, as long as they, she gets the spirit of the part and that's what we care about. Um, and that was pretty, I think that was hard for me as, as, the creator and also just as an Asian American person um, to go through that because every author wants to have their book made into a movie. I mean, most, not all, but most authors do because it's basically just a commercial for your book and then more people will know about it. You know, I think on average Americans read 1.7 books a year, right? So, but they do, I think like 12 or 13 movies a year mm -hmm. um, and not even counting all the advertising for movie trailers or posters or online ads the budget that a movie studio has for marketing is like, it's not even comparable to what a publisher has because publishers margins are, are really razor thin. Um, so I feel like I'm getting away from your question now. What was your, what was the question? 
Yeah, no worries. The question, this is all very useful information about, you know, how much Americans read and the razor thin margins for um, publishers. And the question is more so around like, you know, I heard um, that Lana, for example, um, potentially wouldn't have been cast for this role because uh, studio executives might have been interested in casting, you know, a Caucasian lead instead of the the type of character that you wrote, someone that was also Asian American, right? And I was just curious to, you know, why was that important to you? And, you know, what was that experience like? But I think you've gone into a lot of it. I don't know if you want to add any anything additional. You know, it was, yeah, I think that that's, to me, the character was that. And so that was important to me. And it's not always the case where um, it's important to me. I think sometimes it's, it, it, I, I feel like, um, there's other characters that I have, um, like for instance, in the summer I turned pretty, I feel like um, one of the female characters, the mom is is very much like white to me. She's white in the books. And I think if we were to do a film adaptation, she would be white just because that's who the character is. But of the other ones, I feel very open about that. And so in general, I feel open. And especially with film, it's just, there's so many more layers of it than just you writing a book. So now you could potentially be giving someone else a shot um, to have a career and to um, be in the spotlight that they didn't have before. And before that point, it was just you trying to tell a version of the story that you wanted to tell that felt truest to what you're doing. Um, but because I don't think a book and a movie have to be like a page one to one kind of ratio, it really is like, just imagine it and then it could be. And I think we could have a bigger imagination um, than we often do when it comes to casting. Um, and now I think it's definitely becoming more of a mm. sort of awakening in, in Hollywood um, that you can do that and you can still have a successful film. But I think for a long time, the understanding was, well, people, we have to have like a green lightable actress to play the part. And, you know, only, you. it's not like a coincidence that all the green lightable ones for the most part are white actors. Um, and so I had said to Lana early on, I, I said to her that, you know, this, this book series has a lot of fans. Um, and I really, what I want for you is what um, Emma Watson and Jennifer Lawrence and Kristen Stewart all got out of their book adaptations. And it's not a coincidence that young adult literature um, is mainly read by young girls. And so that's why you have really meaty roles for young women of a certain age. It's all like teen stuff because that's where they're the heroes. That's where they're the, they're the main character. And I think as you get older and you look around, you go, hmm, a lot of these films, especially the ones that are non-romantic, um, have a male lead and they're the hero. And then the woman is just supporting him. And within YA, what I love about it is it is so centered on young women because we know that's our audience and that's who we serve. Uh, so I said to Lana, I really, more than anything, I want you to have this role and mm -hmm. go on and be able to do whatever you want to do and see this as your launching pad into more, just the way, same way that all those other really wonderful actresses who are in those book adaptations have gone on to have these big careers and they're, they are really leading the way. Absolutely. I think that's such a, beautiful way to put it. And I do hope that Lana's career takes off just as Kristen's did, just as Jennifer's did as well, because you're right, um, young adult novels, I felt like I was part of that demographic growing up. I'm sure you probably were as well. Um, was always had my book in a, my nose in a book at least, you know, always reading. Um, so I know we're almost at time and we have a lot of fan questions. Okay. So I'll close off very soon with just one or two more questions. So. The next question I have for you is with e-readers and audiobooks on the rise and the decline mm -hmm. of brick and mortar bookstores, where do you think the publishing industry is going to go? And what are your bets for how readers are going to discover new books in the years to come? You know, I remember when e-books came out and everyone was really concerned and thought that um, print books were over and it just wasn't the case. So I really think that for young people, books are... A, a, extension of their identity. It's like, if you look at people will often take pictures of their bookshelves and it's a way to express like who you are and, and what you love and um, what your personal style is even. So I don't really see that changing. I think that 
as an artifact. I I know for me that when a book comes out that I feel certain that I'm going to want to to keep, um, I buy it in in paper. And there is something that feels sort of timeless uh, about having the actual book in your hands um, and not doing the ebook. So I guess you know everything's always changing. I've seen a million changes since I started out. Which mm-hmm. gosh, uh, my first book came out in 2006, but I think I sold it in 2004. Um, when, I, when I was still in grad school, mm-hmm. and it's changed in so many ways. Um, in some ways, that they're very sad. But just the way that in life everything has changed with with the internet and being able to access everything online. Um, but I, I'm not like really worried about books, and I think you can point to looking at the way that right now there's so many ways for stories to be told. Um, you know, we have streamers and we have um your traditional movie theaters and um you've got like youtube tiktok so many different ways so there's so many different ways for people to tell story um and i don't think the books are gonna um see the their death knells anytime oh, yeah. soon <laughs> honestly because i think hollywood goes to, to books over and over and over again and now there's mm-hmm. just more um outlets for that you know now that we have netflix hulu amazon in all those mm-hmm. places, um, and people they need to have, tell stories, and so it's like, why not look at books um, mm-hmm. for that? It, it used to be much more rare. Well, books are definitely a focused effort that you know someone or a group of people have put together to tell a story in a very, you know, there's it's a finite amount of pages, and it's usually beautiful if it's been published. Um, I am personally running out of space to store my books. So if you have any advice, you know, you can share later. <laughs> I have too many physical books, which is why I started e-readers recently. Um, but to close this off, you know, here's a question that I know many are yearning an answer for. Do you have a fourth book hitting the shelves anytime soon for the To All the Boys I've Ever Loved trilogy? Turning into Beyond? <laughs> um, no, I mean, like, not at any time soon. Um, I always say never say never. You just never know. I thought that it was only going to be two books and I changed my mind um, and did a third one. So, but I've been very focused on the film side and I've um, been doing screenwriting and stuff. And it's just, I think I'm right now I'm full up with um, words, but they're all um, in the screenwriting space. Um, But I also have like three novels that I've been working on for years. Um, mm-hmm. And I tend to work that way. I'll put it aside for a bit and keep coming back to it. And so there there are new stories that I want to tell um, that I just haven't had the chance to yet. Well, we're definitely looking forward to them when they do come out. Well, Jenny, thank you so much for participating in this moderated conversation. We're going to move to some of the many questions that I'm sure you've received here in the comment section. Okay, oh, we have okay. a question. All right, getting started pretty fast. Suzette Escobar has a question for you. What have you thought about how they translated your books into movies? Do you feel like it captures the magic of your books on the screen? I feel like that's more of a um, question for the viewers and the readers than me because, you know, I don't know. I think, yeah, I think that what I was hoping for was uh, to get that same kind of like warm, cozy feeling that I hope that you have when you read the book. I just wanted you to have that same feeling when you watch the movie. And that to me was more important than, um, you know, if someone had the right hair color or if, you know, any number of things like that was, that was, that was my focus. And I do feel like the films um, pull that off, I hope. Thank you. And I think we're ready for our next question. Jessica Suarez, are any of your novels based off of your own personal experiences? Well, the letters, like I said, um, I did write letters, although thankfully they were never sent out. Um, But I think that's probably the most kind of literal, um, you know what, actually, okay, so I would say Suge, my first novel, um, the main character is white and her mother is an alcoholic and they're Southern. And 
none of those things are true about me. And the, the girl was 12 also. Mm -hmm. But I realized after I wrote it um, that so much of my experience as a second generation Korean American um, was in that book um, in ways that I don't know that I could have tapped into if I made, uh, her best friend is Korean in the book, right? And, but she's white. And I don't even know that I could have gone to some of those places um, if I had made, uh, done, done a reversal of that because it was getting kind of like personal I think mm -hmm. into in terms of um, just you know I think so her mother is alcoholic and she really has a lot of burden on her shoulders um, and has to do a lot more things that kids than kids her her age do and I think for me growing up that was my experience too where a lot of people are um, can can relate to having to translate English uh, for your parents or having to help out with paperwork or just be an adult before you're quite ready to be an adult. And I would say that that book is really about that. Uh, and I think that oftentimes, I don't even know what the book was about in terms of how it relates to me until after I've written it. You know, um, books can be personal to you in so many different ways. And that one, I didn't know that I was ever gonna get that published. I didn't know that I would ever get to write again. So I think I just poured out so much of myself into it. I think more often than not, when I've spoken to authors, it seems like there's always a personal mark at some point that's in the book, whether or not they realize it. Um, and thank you for sharing the stories about how, how you grew up and how that probably permeated into the book in some way or another, whether we're conscious of it or not. I think we're ready for our next question too. From Alice Lee, these films come out during a pivotal time for the API community and Asian representation in the arts. What more do you see needs to be done here? I would love to just see more, period. And by that, I mean, you know, I think that there is right now because there's not a ton being made, although it's it's obviously grown in leaps and bounds than it was. Um, there's so much pressure on Asian American creators um, and artists to be able to um, present the the sort of seminal Asian American experience in whatever story they're telling. And I know for me as a storyteller, I'm interested in telling the specific story that I'm telling and not going into it like I you know want to impart these lessons or like teach this to the audience or be very pres prescriptive about it. And I just wish that more there were just more Asian American stories being told so that there wasn't that level of pressure upon each thing that comes out to have to be the best or to have to be um, showing up for everyone because, you know, I know that like with, for instance, with Crazy Rich Asians, there was a lot of um, discourse about it showing a really specific slice of mm -hmm. um, Asian American life, which is like really, really rich people. <laughs> um, and I think most people don't relate to that, but that was the story that it was telling, mm -hmm. you know? And so I just wish that we could get more South Asian, Southeast Asian, like all these other kinds of Asian stories to be told so that we weren't just getting that one slice so that that one thing had to live up to, you know, in a way it's like when a rom-com comes out and it has like two white leads, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to become any more than it is, which is a, rom a, a really lovely, mm -hmm. delightful romantic comedy. It doesn't have to solve like racism or explain, um, you know what I mean? Like it, it, it can just be what it is. Yeah. I just wish that for Asian Americans and for all like artists of color that you could just tell the story that you're telling and have that be enough um, because there's so much to choose from. And I understand why there's so much weight to each thing because it feels like if this thing doesn't do well, then we're never gonna get another chance. And there's a reason people feel that way because that's how it's been historically. Um, you know, one Asian thing comes out and it tanks and then nobody wants to make movies um, with Asian people anymore. But I think now, because there has been so much more um, being being made that hopefully we're, mm -hmm. we've, we're moving beyond that, I hope. I think you touched something pretty, you know, important on that, which is, I like that your books allowed your protagonist who is, you know, Asian American, just be a normal teenage girl. <laughs> like she just got to have normal teenage girl dreams. Um, she was able to 
just be a person. Like, of course, you know, Asian American, but also she just had her personhood aside from that. And I thought that was something really special that you got to represent because that's a story that you wanted to tell. And that's what the book was written to communicate. Um, I think we also have time for a couple more questions as well. From Namrata Shah, Jenny, would you consider writing a spin-off book on Lara Jean or another character's life? Maybe one of the characters she wrote a love letter to. I also want to append uh, to this question, Jenny, that you have a lot of male fans who reached out to me uh, before this talk, and they oh. all wanted to know. I, I didn't have the chance to ask their question because there were just too many questions to ask, but they wanted to know if you'd ever considered in the future as a part of the series or as part of another you know, book that you write. Um, have you thought about writing any male leads? Um, or maybe this book from the POV of one of your male characters? I hadn't thought about it. Um, although with Summer I Turned Pretty, um, those books were written, half of it was from a guy's perspective. So I've done it before. But with this one, I haven't. I think, um, I feel like with Laura Jean's story, I feel good in the way that it's like closing. Um, but for me, when I finish, a novel the characters kind of live on i'm just not like they're like kind of watching over them um so it's not to say that i wouldn't do something else with them but i think it would really have to be something fantastic and um just just exactly the right thing and also be creatively interesting for me because every single thing i do you know i want to feel like i am trying something new or challenging myself in some way um and I think that it's possible for sure. Again, never say never. Um, mm -hmm. But I would have to find my own sort of angle into it that makes it exciting for me to do because it's not just the time that you spend writing the book. It's a, a lot of time spent on, you know, marketing the book and selling the book and talking about the book. So it has to be something that you feel passionate about forever. And um, I think it's all about just kind of finding that doorway into it that makes you feel like I can't wait to get back into the story. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, and we'll also put some room for, I think we have a couple more questions we can take. Nigel and Tim, I think we can put some a few more on. Ooh, I like this one from Desia Ma. Were there any young adult characters you read and loved growing up that have inspired your own writing? Hmm. Well, you know, I'll say this, like, I loved Judy Bloom. I loved Lois Duncan, mm -hmm. Christopher Pike, um, Babysitter's Club. There were a lot, I read everything, um, but YA as it exists today did not exist um, when I was growing up. So you basically went from little kids, like picture books, and then you had like kind of like your third grade, kind of like Dear Mr. Henshaw, Hatchet kind of stage. And then you had like some Baby Stars Club books also mm -hmm. during that time. Um, and then you had some sort of like Sweet Valley High, like teen books um, when maybe you're in fifth or sixth grade. But then you kind of like, I went straight to like Stephen King when I was 10 <laughs> because there wasn't, there wasn't now, we, we have so much more um, to choose from, you know, like it was kind of like the paperback original sort of like um, love stories sort of thing that were you could get like for 99 cents or what you could read mm -hmm. at the time and now i think you the books are valued in a different way and treated a little bit more seriously um and so i didn't i didn't have all this kind of variety but i loved everything i did read and you know including the stephen king <laughs> and then, like danielle Steele and all that you kind of stephen king is not a ya author however he writes adolescence beautifully Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a reason why he's a bridge for so many kids um, who were looking for something that was older than, uh, you know, your little kid stuff, but not quite adult yet. Um, yeah. I think, and I mean that as a compliment because he he writes beautifully and simply and really relatably. I actually am laughing so much internally because I feel like I had a very similar reading trajectory to you. Definitely read all the books that you mentioned, including, I love the Babysitter's Club because of Claudia Kishi, the character there. Mm -hmm. One of the only characters that I saw in my childhood, you know, who had any resemblance remotely to me. And Stephen King, 
It's funny that you mentioned you were 10 when you first started reading him. I feel like that only happens in a household where you grow up with immigrant parents who have no idea what you're reading. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I was really confused. I was very confused um, on some of the stuff. I was like, what is happening? Because it was when, on some of those like sexy things. I'm like, I don't, I don't understand. But then you kind of just breeze past it, what you don't get. And by the way, that was pre like internet. So like, if you were confused, you weren't really like looking it up. I just was like, all right, that's over my head. I'm just gonna like push on forward um, to, you know, the girl who can start fires with her mind. And like, that's interesting and um, feels safe I, for me. I feel like I read a lot of things probably before the time that I should have read them, but that was just a consequence of the way that I, I grew up. Yeah. I don't mind it. I feel like it made me a better person. I'm fine. I, I'm, yeah. I'm normal, normal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. Uh, um, I think we can take a couple more questions. Um, Tim, what's the next one? Okay, this question I believe from Jen Zeller. What inspired you to make the song Kovi Sisters half Korean? I'm half Korean myself and really appreciated seeing that representation in the books and movies. Oh, thank you. Um, the reason why was because I was interested in like a couple of reasons. One, I, I was, a lot of my friends were sort of having kids around that time. And so I was seeing a lot of like biracial families. Um, and so I thought like this felt like a book for, um, I was thinking, I guess about her parents in the book, you know, and who they were. And it, it felt to me natural, but I also was thinking about, you know, this girl kind of growing up um, in a kind of smallish suburban town, which was not very diverse and feeling like an outsider in many ways. Um, I think all teen experiences are about the outsider experience, but this one um, was really, she lost her mom at a really young age. So she lost her kind of connection into the Korean part of her identity. And that was interesting to me and something I wanted to explore where she was trying to find ways to feel close to her mom and that part of herself. And her dad was trying to be helpful, but he had a lot of limitations um, just by virtue of not being Korean himself. And so she's super close to her sisters and they kind of create their own kind of traditions and their own ways to feel close to their mom. And their mom really does represent um, their Asian identity for them. And that was why I did it. And I wanted to like kind of explore that kind of feeling of otherness um, that wasn't necessarily about the immigrant experience. Because I think, you know, one of my goals with the book too was doing a story that felt like a very sort of all American coming of age um, where it didn't have to be centered around her pain or anguish about being Asian. And I think uh, historically you, the kind of books that we see from people of color um, have been about pain and um, the struggle and coming mm -hmm. to terms with that identity. And I think we need those kind of books, but I think we also need books where it's that's not the main point of the story, you know, um, where people are just like living their lives. Uh, yes. So that's what that's what I wanted to do. I, I think you ushered in, you know, a new generation of young adult books for for a lot of young people um, that just, you know, accomplished that. Right. They just got to live their everyday lives. They just got to be people it didn't need to be, you know, Asian Jenny or you know, Black Jenny or Hispanic Jenny, for example, it just got to be, you just got to be a young woman, right, in, in the book. I think that's important. And I feel like recently I've seen a couple of things come out, including Mindy Kaling's, um, was it Never Have I, I can't mm -hmm. remember exactly the title, Never, Never have, ever. Have, I, have I Ever, um, in addition to, of course, uh, your trilogy. Uh, growing up, we never saw films like that or a series like that representing. I think I think it's because the sort of decision makers, the gatekeepers are always like, well, why do they have to be Asian if it's not an Asian story? And I, that's something I've heard before too. You know, like why, why does she have to be? And it's like, um, not a necessity, but it's just a part of the identity of the character, you know? And so I think you're, they're asking the wrong question when you go, why do you have to be? What does the story necessitate um, for her to be Asian? And it's when that's the only kind of thing that people want from you, I think that's what people are delivering um because there hasn't been that opening to just be able to feel free to tell you know a story about a, a girl and her sisters that's not centered around that but it's not 
shying away from it. It's just not mm -hmm. the whole point of it. And I think mm -hmm. uh, publisher, both publishers and I think movie systems have been about like, if, if it's gonna be Asian, then it needs to be about really being Asian and like why that's like hard and what mm -hmm. are, you know, are all the struggles with being Asian. Um, so I, I'm really happy that with To All The Boys, um, it's been a story that I think, I think anyone can relate to that story. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not only um, Asian American fans, but it's all kinds of people I think can read her or watch her and, and feel like she uh, can represent some part of them. Absolutely. And I think it opens a new door for a lot of writers in the future to be able to tell stories similar to the ones that you've told too, um, that maybe before it wasn't validated by, by the market or people were afraid to publish them because they weren't sure if they would sell or if there'd be commercial success. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we only have room for one more question. Um, and let, this one from Hannah Siegel. Did you always envision your series to become a TV series? What part of the process with Netflix made you feel like it was time for you to adapt all three books? Well, so actually it's a movie series. Um, and like, I think for me, I was open, but I think I was picturing it um, as a movie. Um, what was the second part of that question? It was like, what? I think the, um, um, what part of the process of Netflix made you feel like it was time for you to adapt all three books? Well, then they didn't decide to do it all at once. It was like the first one came out and then they were like, we should do the second and third. So I was like, great. It was a hit. <laughs> <laughs> so I was happy to do that. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, well, Jenny, thank you so much for being a part of our conversation today. I know we weren't able to get to all of the hundreds of comments that were put into this box. So um, if you are interested in Jenny's work, um, it's her film is coming out on February 12th on Netflix. I'm sure she has some projects up her sleeve and we'll be sure to share them uh, amongst the Asian Google network and beyond uh, when we hear more about them. And uh, for those who've asked questions today, we will make sure to send you some information uh, if you were a winner of the lottery for Jenny's books. So Jenny, thank you again for your time. It has been such a pleasure having you on the Toxic Google Show today. And we wish you all the best in 2021, some brighter days ahead. Thank you so much. Thanks guys. <laughs>